Hey, welcome to the SBL podcast. Okay, so usually it's Scott and Ian, but today I am joined by Ben Williams, Grammy award winning upright and electric bassist, composer, singer, band leader, and producer whose work, who has worked with legends like Pat Metheny, George Benson, Jose James, David Sanborn, Lauren Hill, Whitten Marsalis, Robert Glasper. Check out that name drop list. It's so amazing. He's won countless awards and honors, put out three full-length records of his own that combine traditional jazz roots with more modern neo-soul vibes, echoing the soulquarian pioneers, Dilla, The Roots, Erica Badu. He has a brand new project with Cindy Winters called Butterfly Black, and we're going to get into all of it today. I'm so excited to be here with him. Ben, man, thank you so much for joining me. Man, thank you for having me. Yeah, dude. I want to take it back to 2011. So if you'll allow me to go back to your first record, I push play on home, right? Which is the first track on state of art. And I'm greeted with this impeccable execution and respect of straight time. I sort of think that like as electric bass players, uh, that group of people can be skeptical of a traditional jazz upright bass player, like with a, with a swing feel, um, maybe having less experience and respect around the straight grid. And I didn't get that from you at all. Like right away, I was like, oh, like straight grid is crushing. And so I just mm. wonder, like if you could speak to that a little bit and tell us what contributes to this like brilliant aspect of your playing. Um, wow. Well, thank you. First of all, um, you know, I, um, uh, I, I just like to say I'm a, you know, I'm a, just a fan i'm a connoisseur of music um and you know I've, I've always been like that that's just um sort of a um just a product of my upbringing um my, my just my cultural upbringing my musical upbringing and um you know i just to give you a little background so i grew up in washington dc yeah and um you know i don't know if like mo many people really um think of dc as like a musical town but um you know, it really is, you know, I know every, everybody thinks of DC and it's like Washington and the seat of the government, but you know, it's one of the most, um, it's a, it's a city full of talent and, um, and great musicians. And, um, you know, these musicians that I, I grew up around that I spent, I spent a lot of time with, they would, they, they all could play just all different styles of music, mm. you know? So the same, the same guys and, and ladies that you would see, you know, sometimes playing at the jazz club, you know, they also played in church or they played in a, you know, an R and B band, you yeah. know, you could see them playing with the hip hop cats. And, um, you know, I mean, when, and that's when that's what, just what you see, you know, you just accept that as normal and standard. So, um, you know, so the, all those influences, all those musical influence I brought with me, um, when I, when I picked up the bass, I started playing mm -hmm. bass at 11 and, um, you know, jazz is something that was introduced to me, you know, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's the case with probably a lot of people, and a lot of musicians, um, you know, it's not just something you hear on the radio. It's just, right. you know, something that you hear a lot in, and just the, in the public. Um, but, you know, I was, I was very blessed to be introduced to that music, you know, from my teachers in school mm. and, um, yeah, you know, and I just fell in love with it. But, um, you know, it was always, um, you know, always had a, just a broad perspective of music in general. So, um, you know, and that's, you know, sort of regardless of what the instrument is, you know, it's the, for me, it's all of just, it's about the music and that, yeah. you know, the bass is sort of my vehicle to express that. And, um, yeah, you know, I just like, I love groovy music, you know, and whether that's Miles Davis, you know, whether that's Charlie Parker or Fela Kuti or D'Angelo, yeah. yes, you know, if it feels good to me, you know, I'm that's that's where that's where my attention goes to. Yeah. And I mean, I feel like I could tell that right away, right away. It was like, oh, this isn't a jazz purist or a traditionalist. Right. Um, and so you mentioned you start playing at 11. Did you play, were you playing upright right away or did you start on electric? I actually started on upright. 
that was my, amazing. Uh, the, the, the first, yeah, the first. Like in school, I, are, are you are you like Boeing? Are you like French Boeing in like junior high orchestra or like is yeah. that the vibe? Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah. So, um, so funny story. I, you know, I don't know if this is most the most romantic story about picking up the bass, but um, I actually wanted to be a guitar player. Yeah, you know, um, I, I grew up uh, and, and still do love loving Prince. You know, I was a big Prince oh. fan. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just like used to watch Purple Rain all the time. And um, I mean, that was like for me, that was the the pinnacle of like what a musician is. You know, he played all these different instruments. Right. Right. And I was like, man, like, I want to do that, you know. Um, So naturally, I was kind of gravitated toward the guitar, you know, like just that Mm -hmm. like idea of being a rock star. Yes. And um, so when I got to uh, middle school, um, you know, my my mother, you know, she was um you know always just supported my creative my creativity and um you know whatever that wherever that led me and uh you know she she made sure i was in a school that um that had an arts program so they Mm -hmm. they had music classes and uh, i saw they had a guitar class i was like oh i can i can learn to play guitar now Um, but of course the guitar yes i can be yeah man yeah right right but um but the guitar class filled up and uh but before I, I could sign up for it and um i basically just signed up for the 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 class that's to me was like the next closest thing hmm. it was strings one um so you know in my <laughs> head something like, with I'm strings like, oh, right <laughs> like, right a guitar yeah, has yeah. strings on it yeah you know, that's right i guess yes. this is this is this seems close enough yeah um uh, but it was the orchestral class so right you know i, I get i get there and there's violins and violas cellos and there's one bass there was one bass in the, in the room mm. and um i just happened to get there and um you know the teacher asked me which one I, which one i wanted to play and i was like um i don't know i guess the big one i'll, I'll play the big one <laughs> <laughs> dude that's crazy so it was as simple as that yeah and the you know the rest is history i guess dude do, did you so you're 11 i mean i i started out on electric and then two two join ensembles and stuff in school i had to play the upright and for me it was horrible it was arduous like i never fell in love with that instrument i always felt like oh my god it it was the obstacle actually for me Mm. to what i had to do and it and i sort of in, in a way regret that like i wish in a way that i had maybe started on that and then gone to the electric but did you feel that or or were you how long did it take you to fall in love with it um, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like I, I fell in love with the sound of the instrument like mm. right away. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember having, uh, I had a private teacher and, um, his name was Paul, uh, Robinson mm. and, um, he was really cool. Cause he was, um, he was like a younger guy. He, I think he was in college at the time. So, cool. you know, he yeah. was like listening to like a lot of the same music I was. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we would be um, setting up, he'd pull out his bass and he'd put like a Biggie Smalls bass line on the upright. And I was like, and like, you know, all the light bulbs just went off. Yes. I was like, you know, so I made this connection between this music that I was already into and listening to, you know, like hip hop and and R&B. But I was hearing it like played on this, what, up until that point, I thought it was like just an orchestral uh, yeah. instrument you play an orchestra or right. jazz band. Like and it had like, oh, no, man. yeah, like it had no right to or no place to play contemporary music or like those two spheres were never going to collide. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, so I was like, oh, why? Uh, wow, you could play, I could play all the music, all this other music, and I can just, it doesn't really matter what what instrument, it's, you know, the notes are just the notes and, you know, you can, you can make that, the instrument do whatever you want it to do. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was just, uh, I just love the sound and like sort of the versatility of the instrument, mm-hmm. you know, that you mm-hmm. can play with the bow and that you could play like bass lines and you can like kind of solo and play. I was like, you know, this is like a, it's like a Swiss army knife of an instrument. Like, Oh, that's so you cool. Can do, you, you can do all this stuff on it and all those cool things on it. So, and did that like your your perception of the instrument from being this like stodgy classical thing that was like academic 
orchestral only. Were, am I right? Were you playing French bow or German? I guess I have a 50, 50 chance French. there. It was, it was French. French. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. Me too. Oh man. Yeah. And you know, and Still I do. just remember, dude, there was nobody for me that was like, Oh, and check it out. And, and played like a, like a hip hop baseline for me. It was just like, Oh man, this thing is like, it just stays in this lane. But was that mm. private teacher experience for you? The thing that opened up all those doors into the versatility um, that you felt that, that instrument was? Yeah, you know, because I, um, I mean, I, also, as I started playing the instrument, um, there was a jazz program at the middle school as well. So, um, you know, I had orchestral classes, but then we had like jazz band in the afternoon. Yeah, man, cool. So, um, so I had a whole, you know, a whole different perspective of the instrument from being in that class as well. And, you know, learning like Charlie Parker and like Miles Davis. Yes. And, um, you know, just learning this music that, that, you know, that they, they, they call jazz. And, right. um, uh, for me, it was, I, I fell in love, like with the idea of the music that, you know, you could, you know, you could play these songs that were written by these, you know, these guys, but you, you could play your own solo. You could like, you know, yeah. everybody, everybody was able to like, you know, sort of do their own thing and you kind of like have fun with these songs. Right. And I was like, this is, this is so cool. You know, um, just that, like, it was like just being on a plate and like a musical playground. Yeah. Because you definitely didn't get that sense. Or I mean, I didn't, we don't, I think in the, uh, like the academic classical context. Right? right, where you're reading, you're reading you got that French the bow, <laughs> dude. That's I had it this is. moment, yeah. yeah, man. I had this moment where I was standing next to Tony Valencia, you know, who was playing bass next to me, and I was like, dude, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be better if we played those A's like up an octave and and maybe in a different rhythm? And he was like, uh, maybe. He was like, ask the teacher, and you know, I was like, hey, c could we change the rhythm? And she was like. Oh, like looked no. at me like I had flown in from the moon. You know, she was like, right. absolutely not. Right. You're going to like edit, edit this, uh, edit this Beethoven. Yeah. Dude, sure. <laughs> you know, like I wanted to, I would always see that stuff and think like the basses shouldn't be playing. That. I mean, it's so funny, dude, eighth grade, right? Like, what did I know? But I remember right. that feeling too, of being in a jazz program and thinking, Oh, this has so much more freedom of, you know, incorporating yourself into it a little bit. That's, that's amazing. And that makes sense to me yeah. that you, that you had that. I heard that like in your playing right away. I gotta, I gotta ask you about this second record. So, you know, you put out the second record coming of age. You, the, the thing that stood out to me on that was smells like teen spirit, right? So you do this cover near the end of the record smells like teen spirit. And I saw the title and of course, like I want to click on that. I was a huge Nirvana fan and, you know, and I was like, Oh, I wonder, I wonder what the arrangement is going to be. And then dude, I was surprised and delighted that it was a chord melody, that it was a solo arrangement on the bass. Like I was expecting an ensemble arrangement and mm -hmm. man, I mean, I would just love to ask you and to you for you to give your insight on how you think about taking a song like that. I mean, that's that classic jazz tradition, right? Of taking a, a modern song and making it, you know, incorporating it into the genre of jazz. But when you mm -hmm. do that with a tune and you make it a chord melody, do you have a process or do you have a way that you start? Like, what do you start with when you endeavor to do that? Um, well, first I just, I decide on a song, you know, mm. a, a song that, that I like that, yeah. that speaks to me, um, and, and a song with a great melody that, um, I, I think those, those kind of things are just universal, yeah. you know, like regardless of genre, um, like smells like teen spirit is just a great song. It's just, a, it's a, a beautiful melody <laughs> and, um, you know, you could play that song on any instrument and it sounds good. You don't really have to do any, you have to do much to it. Um, and it's so good. It's probably, it's best to not do too much to it, you know, hmm. um, yeah. just kind of let, you know, um, just sort of, uh, find a, um, a unique way of, of playing it. So, um, yeah, um, I guess probably for a few years before that, um, I started, developing this like kind of solo bass um uh technique 
and um it actually started happening on these gigs so i was um I, i've been touring um still do work, I work with stefan harris and blackout mm. um, which is an amazing incredible band um very like genre bending and like you know just creative and um there was always this point in the show you know stefan is very like in the moment so he like just to sort of prove that fact he would ask the audience you know who do you want to start the next song oh damn and like and I'd say like 98% of the time, people would just yell out, the bass, the bass. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it shocked me because like, <laughs> I mean, after a while, I was just like, they're going to say the bass. And then they do. <laughs> I'm like, okay, all right. <laughs> wow. You yeah. know, and the, and the first few times I was like, oh man, what am I going to play? How do I just start a song by myself? Right. And, um, and after a while, I was like, you know, I started just um, sort of conceptualizing like how to play like do like a solo presentation of the bass hmm. and um you know obviously like this has been done before um you know at, at a very high level like people like stanley clark right um and i've seen like ray brown and like ron carter um victor you know you know on the, yeah and victor and like yeah. Derek hodge yeah you know play these like this beautiful this music you know and it was like they weren't even playing the bass anymore they were just like mm. um and, and, you know, you see, sometimes we forget as bass players that the average person hardly ever gets to hear the bass by itself. Right. Yeah, you're right. You know, and people are just really fascinated by the instrument, you know, because it's something that you hear. It's like it's um, it's in all the music that you listen to, but like very few people like get a chance to just hear like that instrument by itself. Yeah, yeah, um, right. And I think it's just like a beautiful opportunity when you can to just like just show people what this instrument can do by itself. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, so for me, for like, for the, so, you know, go back to your question. So the first step is like finding a song, you know, that speaks to me that I love, uh, which smells like teen spirit. That was like, you know, an iconic song of, yeah. of my generation. And, um, so I start to work it out on the instrument to see, um, at what cross points I can play the melody note and the bass note. Um, and sometimes you have to move it to a different key to mm, do that. Yes. Um, a key that works on the bass, you know, because right. we know, we understand which keys work better. Right. Yeah, Cause so, F um, is a drag like F minor where they right. do it. Right. I mean, the F, original. Yeah. Is a drag. It's almost, it's almost, <laughs> yeah, it's almost impossible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like, I'm like, if I just take it down a half step, then I got, I got the low E and like, perfect. Yeah. Oh, cool so you know and i just figured out oh man i can play this note and the bass note at the same time and this part of the melody and you know sometimes you have to offset the bass note a little bit but um yeah so it just kind of started there and i just sort of just worked it out and um uh i i actually didn't plan on recording it um hmm. shout out to my the, the guitarist uh, who played in my band around the time, Matt Stevens. Cool. Um, he, he used to hear me messing around. He was like, man, you should record that. You know, we were in the studio and I, he was like, man, that, he was like, that shit right there is killing. Yeah. Yeah. And, yes. um, Shout I was out like, to okay. Matt. Yeah. I was like, all right, man, let's, let's, uh, press record. You know, we'll see what happens. And I just did that thing in one take. And, um, Oh dude. Um, yeah. So that's like, um, just me playing all that, you know, in one take. That's you know, there's no overdubs, no edits, none right. of that. Yeah. Oh, it's so cool. And and what I mean, and hopefully, uh, maybe in the edit, it'd be so great if we had a snippet of it. So I'm just shouting out the editors right now. It'd be so great to <laughs> include a little of that. And and if we can't do it, please go out check out Ben's version uh, of "Smells Like Teen Spirit" because it. It is really lovely. And it really is like a masterclass on how to think about like what part of the tune to highlight at each moment, because you can't do all of the parts at the same time. So you have to make choices, right? Like when you're like outlining the chords, when you're playing the melody and it's just, it's really stand out to me. Um, and I wonder too, like, so, so you're on that stage with that band and will you mention the name of the band again that kind of you started you thinking about this process uh stefan harris and blackout okay cool uh, stefan harris um uh, amazing brilliant vibraphonist and, and blackout uh, is like the name of the band 
Yeah, that's the name of the band. So it's uh, yeah. Terry on Gully on drums, uh, Casey Benjamin. Um, a lot of people know from Robert Glasper Experiment. Um, cool. Um, Mark Carey on uh, keys and, and myself. It's a heavy band, man. Yeah. And, and so you're up there. And like when he would say, I just want, I just want to paint this picture too for the audience. Like he would say, okay, who wants to, who, who want, like what instrument should start out the next song? And everybody goes bass. Does that mean then that you're playing the next tune on the set list, starting it on bass? Or did it mean that like, this was a moment for you that you were going to create something new or play something that was in your bag or like, what did you have to do then when they said bass? So, so both. So usually we, we, we've had like a loose set order and yeah. um, so I knew what song that we were going to play. So I was ba- essentially like setting up the song. I was doing yeah. the intro to whatever the next song would be. And, um, you know, I, I I just started thinking as the, the more I did it, I started thinking, approaching it more like compositionally. So mm-hmm. sometimes I would I would start in a different key and sort of like work my way um, and do like modulations within the solo. And, yeah. you know, sort of bring to bring you one place. Maybe I'll start from the key of the song we ended and sort of like figure out, you know, uh, little modulation points. Wow. Um, just kind of almost like, um, you know, like Bach or like, yeah. Um, you know, like, a, you know, uh, like a Beethoven piece where like, you know, they just move around. Like just, they have this beautiful way of moving around to these different keys and you like start one place and they just next thing you know, and you're in another key. Mm. Um, so I just started to think about that. Like I started to approach the bass more compositionally than just like, oh, let me just play some bass stuff. Yeah. Right. Well, and what a cool opportunity to get to do that. Right. Because it almost like if you don't get an opportunity to do something like that, or if you're not made to do something like that, it's a rare individual that just will, <laughs> you know, like right. you almost have to be like, pushed into the pit <laughs> like, absolutely gotta go. absolutely that's yeah. the best <laughs> sometimes that's the best way you know <laughs> oh terrifying but uh but the best way well it's so cool it's like it served you so well um i gotta i gotta keep going i mean so we're now i want to ask you something about um that 2020 release so you put out this record called i am a man um stand out mm-hmm. to me as i was going through that was march on I, w- which i just mm-hmm. love the the drum groove on that it's this very like really intentional dilla time feel and i'm wondering if yeah. you can speak to like falling in love with that sound and that time feel and and specifically what you think that people get wrong when they try to do it or like analyze it there are a lot of people out there who talk about it and try to play it and it feels a certain kind of way and so i'm curious like hearing you guys do it um sounded great and i'm curious yeah like when did that start for you and and what do people get wrong about it yeah well first you gotta first thing you gotta do is call the right drummer um (laughs) yeah right uh, (laughs) right and you know most that that's pretty much taken care of you know when you uh, have a drummer who understands that yeah um because it's, it's really all about the drums um and who played drums on and, that so that's uh justin brown okay um so for those who don't know that's um the drummer who plays with everybody including thundercat and um you know yeah. he's just he's he's brilliant so we um we met in new york we're we're the same age um we came to new york like he, uh, he got there a few years before me, but we, we played a lot of, a lot of gigs together coming up. And, um, yeah, you know, he, he's just one of those like drummers that can just take any, like the idea of something and totally just abs- like abstract it. And I feel like that's what really, that's the spirit of Dilla. You know, it's sort of yes. like, it's like Picasso, mm. you know, like it's like abstract art. So, you know, when you look at abstract art, right, you know what a face looks like. We all know what a face looks like. We know, yeah. like, um, you know, so the, you're, you have a context of what you're looking at, but you're, like, sort of abstracting the thing um, yeah, man, to you're the point the where it's, like... Over here. You're putting the eyes yeah, the up here. Are, <laughs> it's yeah. like, yeah, you know, what's a, you know where, like, a face is supposed to look like, and this is obviously a face, but right. it's like, 
yeah okay now but the nose is over here now and it's like <laughs> yeah half the size of the face or like you know it's yeah. um so that's how i kind of think about like dilla it's like abstract mm. like hip-hop mm. um and i think the the, the secret and I, i'm so glad you brought that up because yeah I, you know i had this uh, this uh this conversation a lot about like um hearing people play dilla and um you know, I think we have to attribute a lot that a lot of that to uh, like Robert Glasper and the you know his the, the experiment, yeah. Um, and Chris Dave, who, um, you know, just like was a was a master of that 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 feel, yes. Um, of that that push and it's like a push and pull. So you have to feel that the the, the Dilla thing is all about the push and pull. So I think what a lot of maybe drummers get wrong is they they get the pull part but they don't give you the push. Mm. So they, you know, they sort of like boil it down to like, Oh, just play behind or just play like right. lazy and sloppy. And now it's Dilla. Like, nah, that's, that's not really it. You know, it's about the, like bending the time, but it's all, it's still right there. It's the, that time is not going anywhere. Right. You know, yeah. The just, tempo isn't slowing down. I mean, the tempo right. rides on the same, but it's the placements. Yeah. So, so is it, I mean, typically is it like snare a touch behind kick a little on top or, or how, how do you think of it? Like if you were to, to describe that drum beat, like how would you describe it? Um, I don't, <laughs> that's, that's the hardest thing to describe <laughs> it. I don't know. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, I know, I, I know what it, I think you, you, it's really about the feeling. I know what it's supposed to feel like. Mm -hmm. Um, and really it's the, the drums sort of push, put actually push the time. If you really listen mm -hmm. like Dilla, the drums are like, it feel, it has this like illusion of like laying back, but the drums are sort of driving it. The drums yes. are like really driving it's cause it's, it's hip hop. So like the drums have to be. Like, leading the charge it's, it's driving the music you know yeah. hip-hop is about the drums mm -hmm. so the, and the bass is sort of what like he tends to play back so right um so the drummer has to like really is very like much responsible for the feel and then the bass you just have to like trust that you know the drum is going to stay it's going to keep it locked in and you know sometimes yes. they the, the illusion is sort of like when you hear certain parts of the kit, maybe ahead or like a little bit behind, because he does like both things. If you really like listen to it, like sometimes the kick will be, um, a, will, will like sound ahead because like maybe the hi hat is back a little bit, but the snare might be exactly it, you know. So right, yes, it's like where what's actually where is the pulse, you know, um. And that's the, that's the feel. That's, that's how it's hmm. supposed to feel. Yeah. It, it, it's funny. I've heard a bunch of different drummers do it. And, every, and like anything, like a swing feel or like a funk feel or whatever, right? Everybody has their own interpretation of it. I heard um, Richard Spaven, who's a great drummer in London, who, who plays like Detroit, you know, Dilla feels. And he was talking about how like it's more in the subdivision where like you can make something feel that way by altering the hi-hat, but the kick drum, you know, like he's like, I'll put the kick drum right on. Like if there was a click running, the kick drum will be on every time. Right. But the hat is the thing that makes it feel. And the difference between the hat and where the snare falls, like you can really hear it in that. And it, it's just, it's fascinating. I love to ask people that know something about the music because um, for me, I haven't spent a lot of time playing it, but when I hear it, it's so intriguing to me. So it's so fun to ask people who are like in that and like really respect it and love it and do it well. So man, I love the idea, yeah. dude, I am going to think about this a lot. This idea that it's Picasso, like, because you have to come with a context, you have to come to Picasso with a context mm. of a face. <laughs> and then you're like, right. Oh, that's a face, exactly. but it's like rearranged. In a, in a really exactly. interesting way. Yeah. Oh, right, I love it. Right. Man. Um, let me, let me ask you about upright bass. So something else I noticed, watched a bunch of live stuff, listened to the records. You really have lovely intonation. And to me on, on the upright, boy, what a struggle. And I mean, I know it's a struggle for everyone, even, even someone like you, I'm sure with lovely intonation, it's always a constant thing on your mind or like a thing that you're working on. 
but it's really, it's really, really great for you. Um, and I'm curious, was there any specific exercises or a period of time or something that you can give us like that helped you really hone that sense of intonation for you? Um, playing and practicing with the bow. Mm. I'll say that's sort of the, that's, that's the secret. That's the, um, that's kind of like the running, uh, or like training in sand or like, you know, <laughs> jogging with like weights on your ankles. Yeah. Or swinging the back practicing. with the weight. Right. Like, right. Right. Yeah. 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 Cause you like, you practice it hard. So when you, you know, you know, when you're in the moment, when you're in the game or you're on the stage, it's easier. <laughs> oh, I like, so it. that's the, that's really, you know, when I'm practicing, it's, uh, you know, first of all, you're always working on intonation, like constantly, of course. And um, I sort of figured out I, like a few hacks to sort of tighten up intonation. So um, um, there's um, there's like a few like exercises I would do. So I would play uh, do I would do like scales, and I would um, the the thing about intonation. So there's there's sort of two things. There's a mechanical. There's a physical process. But ultimately, your ear has to be the guide. Yeah. Um, so you have to just, you know, because if you can't hear that you're out of tune, then that's sort of the first it. problem. You can't right. fix it. Yeah. Um, and you know, sometimes you just have to adjust a little bit. Like, oh, that's a little, that's a little under. Let me. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll fix it before you even realize it. You know. <laughs> right. Yes. Um. And um. So you know, I just practice. Um. You know, the, the the thing about upright bass, what makes the playing in tune so hard is the shifting because there's no frets, right? So every right. time you move your hand, you know, wherever you wherever that finger lands, it's got to be spot on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so you have to pra practice shifting and like just building that, developing that muscle memory and sort of just like it's a collection of these like you know, shifts going from one note to the next. And, you know, as I, as I play, every time I'm, um, I'm working on scales or etudes or a song, if I play something and like, I play one note and the next note is out of tune, I, I stop. Mm. I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. Why, why did I play that out of tune? Mm. And, you know, you start, you have to start keeping tabs of like, um, certain things that you play out of tune. Yep. You know, cause we, all kind of have, we always have a tendency of like doing certain things. And I think that's a, a general thing with like practicing habits. You have to like, you have to know yourself and know like what your bad habits are. Yes. And things that you don't, things what you think that you do well, you'll do well. But like practicing is about fixing those things that you don't do well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's just, going from one note to another it's just can be tricky and you just just zero in on that until that thing is is good you know and um you just do that for a few years and you know <laughs> next thing you know you're playing a tune you know? yeah right i mean i really remember that like starting upright i mean it's still terrifying to me like big shifts oh it's it's like that's the point those transition points are the risks Right. And mm -hmm. I think that sometimes, you know, just as you're saying, we practice, you know, you, you do the things you're good at because they sound good. Right. But actually right. practicing those transition moments, you know, getting from, you know, that fourth finger position into now that new first finger position. Oh, damn. That's a hard, you know, that's hard to hit yeah. it right on. And I love to this idea of it's your ear because you're never going to play a note exactly mathematically in tune you'll you'll come close and then you'll have to adjust fast right like there's probably never a moment mm -hmm. where it's per, like like 440 on the nose it's probably 440.3 <laughs> you know and you're and you're always yeah. just trying to like zone in that a and so yeah it's about it's about developing your ear to know i really like that that if you're yeah. if you're in tune or out of tune yeah man um, I mean, and now lately I've been seeing you play fretless electric and some, and, and fretted electric as well. Did, so you started on upright at 11, 
When did the electric bass come into into your playing? And is it something that you love as much? Or, you know, it's like, I'm always so curious about doublers, uh, where where they kind of, where their allegiances truly are, you know? So I'm, I'm just so curious for you, like, uh, can you speak to the electric thing a bit? Yeah, I mean, I started playing electric pretty much right after I picked up the the upright. Okay. So, um, and you know, it was, you know, mostly because of necessity. I mean, you know, a lot of gigs that I would do, I just had to play electric. You know, if yeah. I was playing in, um, got a call to do a church gig, you know, that's going to be an electric bass or, right. um, you know, if I'm, you know, playing an R and B cover band, you know, that's yes. electric bass. Right. Um, and, and for me, actually, it was, it, I mean, I wouldn't say it was like, it was familiar because that's, that's the, the sound that you hear mostly in, in popular music. Radio. The sound and, yeah. So I'm like, yeah. Yeah. You know, 99% of like what came on in stereo, like the bass was an electric bass. So, um, so yeah, you know, so I've pretty much always been playing both since I started. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, um. I've just, you know, I, I feel like I've just been blessed to have this opportunity to play in like a lot of different musical settings. Yeah. And, um, you know, if you, if you ask me and call me to do it, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give it my best. And if I decide I'm going to play this instrument, I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to half ass it. I'm going to, you yeah. know, approach it with the same respect as I would do any, any other instrument on this with their instrument. Yeah. Um, so, well, so like, I mean, yeah. I love that because that that speaks to, you know, what you said in the beginning around like respecting you just loved music. It wasn't so much that, you know, you're a, a purist of anything. You just really loved music. But now I'm going to hit you with the the hard question, dude. The house is on fire. It's on fire. And you can only grab one thing. You got you got, you know, something I don't know what else you got here, but you can only grab <laughs> the neck of an upright bass. Or the electric bass. What's coming out of the house with you? I mean, I'm I'm gonna have to go with. I mean, they're in the room, man. They they, they can hear me, man. But uh, it's gonna have to be the upright, man. You know, <laughs> that's um, for me. That's like that. That's that's home. That's kind of home for me. And I feel yeah. like you know, just honestly speaking, that's where my where my real voice is. Yes. Um, on, on that instrument, I feel like I've developed my voice uh, more so on that instrument. Um. And you can play without an amp, so. <laughs> yeah, right. Right, that's right. Yeah, when the grid goes down, man, you're so still like, making music. Exactly, when the, when, the po- when the power goes out, I'm like, I'm good. I'm still like, good I'm over cool. here. I can hear, I can, I can still hear. Oh, man, I love it. Um, I'd love to talk to you about this new project, uh, which I just checked out. So cool, man. So Butterfly Black um, and this new tune, yes. uh, I Just Want to Love You, featuring this super fun aesthetic throwback to classic R&B. I mean, you know, I mean, I see in the video the Whitney vibes. It feels like Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis, Prince. I mean, I love that you mentioned Prince because I, I live in Minneapolis. I've lived here since 1997. And so mm. Prince, everybody has a Prince story in this town. You know, like mm. Prince is such a legend worldwide, but in Minneapolis, it's even heightened. Uh, so I love that you mentioned that and your respect for for the Minneapolis funk. Um, but can you talk about how that project came together and uh, and how you got to know? Um, uh, I'm trying to find Cindy Winters, right? Cindy Winters, yes. who plays with you yeah. in that man, yes. so cool. I'd love for you to talk about that project a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we met actually. Um, um, sort of informally some years ago in New York. Um, so Cindy comes from the Broadway world. Um, mm. She she was in Hamilton. Um, she played Nala in The Lion King uh, on, Bra- on Broadway. So she's had like some really heavyweight um, Broadway gigs, you know, and she's like a star in that world. And, uh, but, you know, her true passion has you know, always been music, um, you know, before and during the time that she was in Broadway, you know, she's always just wanted to like really dig deep into music. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, if you know anything about that world, it's very, you know, it takes, it's very time consuming, you know, Broadway yeah. actors, you know, they're doing like eight shows a week. Dude. So relentless. yeah, you know, almost every night, you know, some days they do like two shows. I'm like, this shit, that shit is crazy. I know. Man, um, it's crazy. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, she sort of, uh, you know, more or less was like sort of stepping away from that. And, uh, we met actually during the pandemic. Mm. Um, so I, uh, I live in LA now, but at, uh, um, at the time, you know, when, uh, the, the whole COVID shut down, um, I was in New York mm. and, um, she was still living there at the time too. And, uh, we just sort of like connected via Instagram and, um, you know, like a lot of people during that time, we, we were, everybody was just sitting at home, like trying to figure out what to do with their time. Yes. And, um, I was using that time to, um, you know, really just kind of work on like my production skills, you know, sort of like kind of sharpen my, um, my, my skills in that arena. Um, and, you know, I was doing a lot of songwriting, you know, especially, you know, since the I'm a man thing, you know, I've been like kind of digging more into like the singing songwriting, yes. um, exp- expression. So, um, she actually, uh, she, she told me, you know, she was like, uh, I love that album and like mm. really just love the, the sound and like the, um, the vibe of, of that record. And, um, you know, it was funny. She took one of the instrumentals and like did it. She put this video up, um, uh, and sang like uh, another song about like, it was like this kind of funny, um, uh, version of one of the, the tracks from the album. Oh, cool. And, um, yeah and i was like i just loved it and it was like it was funny but also her like her voice was great and it was like this cool melody you know when you just like hear a little bit of somebody's voice and like like i just like i really (laughs) like i like that i like i can tell in like 15 seconds that i would enjoy working with you yes and um so we so we linked up in new york and um and started writing like right away Mm. um I mean, it was like, it was instant. I mean, that, that song, I just want to love you. We probably wrote that in like the first half an hour of, hmm. of meeting. And, um, yeah. So, um, you know, we just kind of had this, like this very, um, well, we had this, like the synergy of, um, the music that we love and music that we wanted to do. Yeah. Um, and you know, sort of like, you know, we're, we're both kids that grew up in the eighties and the nineties and grew up in the world with like Michael Jackson and Prince and Janet and the the, the Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis. So that's like, you know, sort of like the foundation a a large foundation of our, um, you know, just how we, that's, that was like the great R and B of our, um, of our childhood. So, you know, we're sort of tapping into that, but, um, uh, you know, doing, doing it our own way, you know, we kind of know what that is, but so we're not trying to like recreate it, but it's, it's in there. It's, we've been, we've definitely been heavily influenced by that sound. And, um, yeah, so it's, it, it was just, um, a, a beautiful collaboration and actually it started off as me just d- producing, um, her next record. Oh yeah. But, the more we worked together, you know, I was doing a lot of background stuff and like, you know, we were like writing these songs together. It just started to feel, and you know, we would do like some shows whenever we could, um, just as a duo, because at that time you couldn't really even assembled a band together. <laughs> right. Six um, feet apart. Was, like, no, yeah, <laughs> ex- exactly. Yeah, you know, yeah. so it was just like, you know, it was just us and we would do like these shows and, um, you know, we would get like this really uh, great response from people like, oh, you guys like sound like you've been working together forever. And um, that's what it felt like to us, too. And eventually we just kind of came to the conclusion, like, you know, maybe we should just do this as like a, a band. Like we should just be the group, you know, mm. both of us. Um, so we came up with the name. Um, Butterfly Black was actually inspired by. So I, I recorded a song for uh, this documentary called Mr. Soul. Um, it's about this this great uh, show that came out. And um, it was sort of like Arsenio before Arsenio. You know, oh, cool. It's like amazing. You should definitely check it out. Oh, um, man, I haven't seen I need to. Yeah, I'd love to. Definitely. It's like, I mean, I didn't even know about I didn't know that sh- this show existed before I saw the documentary. Wow. Um, so I, I worked on the score with uh, with Robert Glasper. And, um, and there was a song that for the end, the end credits, uh, that we, the song that we wrote with Layla Hathaway. Mm. 
And mm-hmm. um, there's like this, I remember just listening to the song and there was this line in, in the song. She's, she said like black butterfly. I was like, what if we call the band black butterfly? And then Cindy was like, oh, that's cool. There's probably a lot of black butterflies though. Like what do we call it? Butterfly black. And so dope. There it's it a is. great name. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. a great name. And I mean, you know, you bring up singing and that's something else I wanted to ask you about because, you know, you've just got, you have all these skill sets and I encounter bass players um, or musicians maybe that just really are focused on one thing, you know, and they don't really want to, they don't sing BGVs and they're certainly not a lead singer, right? And and I think that singing is such a critical part, even if you're not a lead singer with a, you know, with, that self-identifies with a beautiful voice or something, being able to sing is how you transcribe, right? I mean, you know, being able to mm-hmm. pitch match, you hear a note, internalize it, sing it, find it on the instrument. Do you have, yeah. I mean... I assume you've probably been singing all your life, but do you have any advice or insight on how to kind of get over that thing to, to bring a player into that vulnerable space of singing and playing the bass? Is there something that, you know, you say, Oh yeah, man, I tell people to sing along to this tune or sing scales or like if someone is going like, I don't want to do it, but they kind of know that that's the glass ceiling. They have to break to get to the next mm-hmm. moment or the next step. H- how would you address that? Um, wow. I mean, you know, th- it was definitely a journey for me. And mm. um, I didn't start singing in public until about 2018. Um, really? Like right before. Really? I, so, so just to give you a little I, a backstory about yeah. how I Am A Man came together. Um, I was touring with Jose James mm-hmm. and um, we were doing this Bill Withers project and um at the time i was working on the music for what would be i am a man um but initially these songs were written for guest artists and i was like i had some people in mind that i wanted to sing these songs and uh you know we were hanging out on the road and i was playing them some of the demos so i you know i I sort of you know did these like rough demos um where i sort of like just kind of produced the track that just the idea and i sang on the demos and um i played it for him he was like oh man this this sounds great man this this is some this is some good shit hmm. and he was like who's who's that singing i was like that's that's me <laughs> um <laughs> yeah and he's like man you sound you sound great man you got a great voice you know like oh cool i think you should i, I think you should think about singing more and um i was like you know maybe you know i I never really thought about it, but let me, um, let me take a crack at it. Wow. So, um, you know, and I just started doing a little bit on the gigs and then, you know, I just sort of built up the confidence to, to do it on the album. And, um, and then I'm um, so I had to do it on the gigs, you know, yeah. to, cause it was, that's what I, what I, I sang on this whole album. So I'm like, okay, I have to do this live now too dude yeah right into the fire right i mean again yeah <laughs> just jump you know just right in yeah sometimes you just got to jump off a cliff man yeah and, right you know, and just let the let the parachute open <laughs> um so yeah i mean singing i would say is um you you have to definitely approach it with confidence mm. um singing is like one of those things you it's like it's almost like being a boxer like when you do like most of it is just it's, it's, it's confidence. You have to just believe that you can do it. Um, Cause if not, you probably won't. And it's, it's not going to happen if you don't think you can do it. Right. Um, so that's, that's kind of the first step is like just <laughs> building up your confidence to, yes. um, you know, and, and as a bass player, that's sort of, it's like the other side of the world for us. You know, because we, yes, we, are, we, we're usually in, we're in the back of the stage for the most part. Right. We're at the bottom of the, the spectrum, you know, where yeah. all these, the, the low notes. Right. And, um, when you start singing, it's really kind of, it's, it's, it still trips me out when I'm doing it, especially when I'm playing and singing at the same time, because you're literally like, you're like the ground in the sky at the same time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And oh, I love it. they're both equally, they're both equally important. So, mm. you know, 
it's uh it definitely takes some practice you have to you have to practice doing it um getting that just the coordination um and it's humbling it will definitely humble thyself <laughs> you know <laughs> when you just, if you think you if you think you know how to play bass you start singing and you realize you, you, you feel like you don't know how to play anymore it's like i know oh, everything i knew i thought i knew just flew out the window so let me you have to start practicing really slow again um it's beautiful it, it's very humbling i would mm. say and um you know eventually you get to the point you know where you can kind of do one thing without thinking about the other yeah that's really yeah. the goal you know oh man yeah well <laughs> and it and i love that idea too that it's like what did you say the 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 ground and the sky but no you didn't it, it was two two things what is it it's like the the something in the sky i gotta go i gotta go back and watch it again yeah yeah the ground and the sky <laughs> the ground and the sky okay you know, yeah you need you need, you need both yeah you do you gotta have both but it's like you're very rarely executing both but man that's yeah. i love that um i i gotta ask you because this is you know a lot of bass players check this out um, and a lot of them are really into gear. And it's interesting because, you know, when I see photos of you, you're not really, it doesn't strike me like you're a big gear guy. But then, you know, I'm checking out YouTube and I hear this just like sick octave pedal bass sound on high road. You know, I'm like, mm -hmm. damn, dude. Like, okay. I'm like, all right, dude. Ben's got a couple of boxes on the floor. He's kicking <laughs> on a couple yeah. of things here and there. So can you speak to... Um, what you like about effects or and that specific octave pedal sound because it was like man it felt great and big what do you, what do you like for pedals um you know i just kind of whatever gets the job done um so i um so that octave sound um for that particular song i was sort of like kind of had like stevie in mind you know mm -hmm. like seven like kind of like classic like 70s it's like synth bass stevie yes um so, so i was um you know that's what made me bring out the octave pedal i was just trying to get that like sort of synthy that that sort of bass synth sound um what octave pedal do you so use yeah, what is that it's a it's a aguilar it's a um the, the optimizer or whatever the, the optimizer yes yeah, the optimizer yeah, yeah. Um, oh it sounds so great. yeah that's yeah that's that's my octave pedal on that one do you find and, um, that like sonically you're motivated by references? Like, so you just said here you were going for Stevie, like left hand Stevie seventies, you know, kind of like key bass vibes. So when you turn on a pedal, is it because the sound starts here first? Absolutely. All the time mm -hmm. with, with anything, um, you know, pedals are, 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 you know obviously they're they're cool and, and they're they're fun um you know but you i mean i don't do anything unless i there's a reason mm -hmm. why, why i'm using a pedal so um yeah i you know i i have a pedal board when i when i play on a gig and um you know i use i use definitely use effects and um you know like i said it's a, it's about the music for me so yeah um i'm i'm always approaching everything from like what, what what does this song need like what, what, yes what am i what am i going for and um and then i just find how to get that sound you know i'll start from there what do you have on that pedal board when you when you go out and play bass what do you have on that thing um so yeah i have an octave um uh have um a Let's see a reverb um so hall of fame reverb tc um yep. yeah yep um i have a let's see what else is on there um it's right here we just <laughs> oh yeah we're gonna get we're gonna get a peek at it oh yeah there it is <laughs> so let me guess on. all right yeah i got the oh the mxr the carbon copy yeah the, delay the delay the delay um the bass the chorus the mxr as well um the filter twin i have aguilar fil filter twin oh yeah yeah yeah. that's a cool pedal and um overdrive I have mxr overdrive and 
Yeah, but uh, compressor, it's an MXR compressor. You got a few rectangles on that board, dude. Okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So um, you know, that's kind of like for me, you know, I don't I don't go too crazy with effects, but like that's sort of like what I would pretty much need at any time. The any staples. Time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. Michael League, uh, Snarky Puppy, has this great quote. He did a he did like a pedal thing for Reverb.com, and he said this great thing that I think about all the time. He said, I only step on a pedal when it would be musically irresponsible not to do so. It's like, you know, <laughs> so like if Snarky drops into a thing and it's supposed to be like big hip hop and it needs an octave pedal and I don't step on an octave pedal, that would be musically irresponsible. Or if we're doing a thing and I'm swinging and it should be like Bootsy, it would be weird not to have envelope or, you know, so. Right. And I think about that a lot that like, man, the music needs to dictate the the thing that you step on. Yeah. And it, that's just natural Always. for you. Yeah, that's cool. Always. Um, I, I love that. Yeah, man. It's it's great. I think about it a lot. Um, so check this out. I have a, a great friend um, named Aaron Fabrini, who is a great bass player. He plays pedal steel, but he plays upright really well, too. And he, you know, we're, we're both kind of electric bassaholics. We, we, you know, we would go like electric bass shopping with one another. And I have too many electric bass guitars, but I only have one upright. And he is similar. He, you know, he's got a bunch of bass, electric basses, but one upright. And he said this thing to me once where he said, you know, I think with the upright, like the best, the best bass is the one that you have. Like it's the one that you put mm -hmm. time into versus there's yes. this thing with electric of like the, this holy grail search. But I don't feel mm -hmm. like that's the same vibe with upright. Do, do you know what I mean? Do you feel that at all? Absolutely. I mean, in my in this room, I have one upright, and I have a whole <laughs> I have a, a whole rack of electric bases over here. Dude, how so, how many bases uh, are in that cool. rack? How 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 many bases are in that rack, dude? We got enough. All right, this, <laughs> one, two, <laughs> three, four, five, six. There's probably someone a one in a case somewhere too. So probably, <laughs> we're six, gonna six say or seven. Seven, dude. Let's so, say seven. So, yeah. So what is that? Like, is that only about obviously they're big and so to have seven uprights would take up a lot of space but like why is that the upright culture where like you're going to get a base and you're not maybe going to pine away for the next one and the next one and the next one why is that different um i don't know that's a good question i mean i think um well, first of all, like upright bases, they're all, you know, th th there's no like, there's no brand, there's no two uprights that are the same, right? You know, and they 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 vary a lot um, from instrument to instrument. So one to the other is it's 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 a it's very very different. Yeah, you know, they're like human beings. They're like people. You know, they all sound different. Um, you know, the spacing is different. Um, the the uh, the way they feel. So when you sort of like, you know, going back to like practicing intonation, all that stuff and like getting to know your instrument mm -hmm. on, the, on the upright, um, you know, it's like you're kind of getting to know a person. It's like a relationship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and you, you get that bond. I mean, it, and the thing with the upright is like there's just that, that sound is there's nothing between you and the sound. Yeah. You know, obviously you have you have strings um and you know there's some mechanical aspect aspects to it but you know that sound is just like you and your fingers and the instrument yeah and right it's um it, it's a very like sort of pure um it's a pure thing that you are, are producing um so yeah i think when you sort of find you know most bass players they they might they might go through a couple of bases before they find that one Mm -hmm. And uh, but when you when you find that one, um, it tends to, you know, most great bass players more or less play the same bass for their entire career. Like, yeah, I know. It's uh, so I cool. I mean, like Ron Carter, right? That bass, you know, I've I've gotten to play his bass. It's the same, it's the same bass he used on those records with Miles. Jeez, dude. So, so he's yeah. still he's still playing that bass. How how old were you when you found your potentially like lifelong upright bass? Um. I mean, the the one I have now is, um, you know, 
these things are not cheap. <laughs> so I know, I know, um, it's crazy. You, you know, you you start, you start with the, you know, maybe a student level. Um, you know, I had to play a school base, and then yeah, sure. You know, you sort of you get to you get to a level, you start like sort of outgrowing the instrument, and um, you know, you just you get enough money where you can sort of get maybe something the next level. Um, maybe not quite professional, but something in between. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, you just do as well as you can on that until, you know, you just, you get to a point where you can afford, um, you can invest in a, like a real professional base. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's, it gets into, uh, you know, five figures. Oh, for sure. When you when, when yes. When you, when you get there. So, um, once you, you know, you start spending that kind of money on the instrument, it's, it's gotta be like something that you really love. <laughs> and yeah. so I, I, I got, I got this bass. Uh, this is my main bass. It's like an old German bass. Uh, it was about 60 or 70 years old, 70 mm-hmm. years old when I bought it. Um, I bought it in 2010. Cool. Right. Think- I just won the mall competition, so I had some money. <laughs> oh, dude, so sick. Do you okay. feel like uh do you feel like that's the one? Do you feel like like are you do you have wanderlust like, oh, if I maybe if I spend, you know, ninety grand on one, it'll be or do you feel like nope, this is the instrument that you're gonna play into your sunset years? Yeah, I I mean I love it. I love the way it sounds and yeah. it um and the thing about with I mean, any bass, you know, but especially upright basses, they just sound, they get better and better the more you play them. Yeah. And it it sounds twice as good now as it did when I bought it. So, and that's, that's because I'm I'm putting that, I'm putting those notes in it and and like, you know, it's like watching a kid grow up, like, like, oh man, you're, it's giving you back some love that you're putting into it. It's rewarding you for all the hard work, dude, that aspect of upright playing is something that I envy, like looking at it across, you know, like looking at the neighbor's lawn that's greener from electric world. I envy that Mm -hmm. thing of like committing to an instrument, like working really hard to where you actually do outgrow the student instrument. And then maybe the kind of intermediate, you know, prosumer level instrument. And then like, you're going to actually make this commitment, this five figure commitment to a bass Man, in electric world, there is some of that. There are players, right, that really like they have, you know, Jamerson with the same P bass. And, but, you know, he picked that one off the wall. He was an upright guy, right? And he like went into a store and it was 1962 and there was a 1962 precision bass. And, you know, I feel like, man, in electric world, it's more like tools. There's, it's like a drill and there are drill bits or, you know, you, well, you got a Rickenbacker vibe and a Hofner vibe and a Gibson vibe and a Fender vibe and a fretless and a, but there is something so pure and cool about like, nope, I'm going to find this thing. And then we are going to grow together. And I, I'm just, right. I've always been really envious of that. I think it's really cool. And more importantly, you know, you develop your sound on that <sighs> instrument. Yeah. You have to develop your sound. And to the point where it doesn't actually matter, it's not, it's less about the instrument. It's more about you. Yep. Cause I can, I can get on anybody's upright and I still sound the same. Yes. You know? Yes. So at, at the end of the day, you know, and it's not just exclusive to upright. Like, you know, if Marcus Miller so true. and Pino Paladino, you give them the same P base, <laughs> Marcus still going to sound like Marcus. I guarantee you that Pino <laughs> still going to sound like Pino. Yeah, man. I'll, put, I'll bet my house on it. So <laughs> you're absolutely that, right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Oh. oh, man. This has been so fun. I feel like I could talk to you for ages, man. Thank you for spending the time. Um, I would man, love to thank ask, you. too, like, how best moving forward can this community support you? Like, please take a moment and talk about what you've got coming up. Um, any links, any things that we can uh, help support you and how we can keep tabs on you moving forward, socials, projects, all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm on the the social medias. Um, yeah. uh, Instagram um, is Ben WMS on bass, and um, 
you know, you can check out everything that I'm doing. I always keep, you know, all the stuff that I'm doing shows and, you know, new projects, new, new uh, releases on there. Um, yeah. And, you know, if you're on Facebook, I'm on there as well. Uh, my website, benwilliamsofficial.com. So, um, yeah, you know, just check out the music. Um, just follow me and see, I got a lot of interesting, cool things coming up. You know, I'm, I'm always like, digging you know i always got my hands and some cool stuff coming up so um the this, the next year is, is definitely going to be uh some interesting stuff so just you know just stay in touch well and, dude and i'm a fan this. and and every anybody out there who hasn't checked ben out please do it please if uh if we haven't included any any music or um clips in this interview check out the music check out the socials because you you'll be blown away just like I was. So man, thank you so much thank for you. spending time. I, I hope I get to, I hope I get to come and see a show sometime in the future. Please holler at me. If you're coming through Minneapolis, it would be so fun to see absolutely. the show, dude. Yes, absolutely. I, absolutely. I would love to, man. Cool. Awesome. And, uh, okay. Hope to see you soon. Thanks for having yeah. me. Oh, for sure. Thanks for being here. And everybody, thank you so much for listening to the pod. If you could, please leave us a review on anywhere you consume the podcast. It really helps us out. And we'll be back next week with another episode. Take care, everybody.